Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In some of my previous videos, I introduced you to the different types of biological macromolecules and the roles that these macromolecules play uh, in living systems. Three of these micro biological macromolecules, lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates, act as a source of nutrition for many different types of organisms, including human beings. In this video, we'll trace the path of these biological macromolecules through the human body, through the digestive tract, and discuss where and how these nutrients are prepared, digested, and absorbed by our body. So stay tuned. Hi, and again, thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to talk about how our body prepares and digests its food with a specific focus on the biological macromolecules called proteins, uh, lipids, and carbohydrates. These are the three macromolecules that serve as a source of nutrition for us in our regular diet. Now, as you would probably guess, the the first stage in digesting our food actually occurs in the mouth. So the mouth is a source where our food is sort of prepared to be swallowed. So we use our teeth to chew that food and break it into smaller pieces. This process is known as mastication and serves uh, several important roles. First and foremost, it breaks up the food into smaller pieces. This makes it easier to swallow, but also by breaking the food up into smaller pieces, it makes it easier for the enzymes that help to digest our food to actually act on them. So, for example, in the case of carbohydrates, digestion of carbohydrates actually begins in the mouth. And it begins in the mouth with the release of, uh, of a substance called amylase. So amylase is an enzyme that helps to break down starches. Things like uh, uh, amylose and amylopectin are long chains of glucose molecules all chemically bonded together. Amylase is an enzyme that actually begins to digest these carbohydrates and break them into smaller sugars like disaccharides and even in some cases monosaccharides. However, this process is uh, only, only results in the digestion of about 5% of the carbohydrates that are present in our food. And very rapidly, the food is then swallowed, it passes through the esophagus and heads into the stomach. And once it reaches the stomach, the amylase is actually inactivated by the low pH, the acidity of the, of the gastric juices inside of the stomach. In the case of lipids, mastication also helps by breaking up the food into smaller pieces. Uh, there is actually an enzyme known as lipase, as well as some other things found in saliva that act as surfactants. And the end result is to break up those, li those lipids into smaller, smaller droplets. Um, and the surfactants actually act to help dissolve those lipids into water. So recall that lipids are generally fats, and these fats are generally hydrophobic. They don't mix well with water, and since our saliva and most of our digestive fluids are also water-based, one of the challenges our body faces is how to get these lipids to dissolve and actually, uh, you know, sort of absorb themselves into, into the fluids of our body so they can be digested. Uh, uh, lingual lipase actually does a pretty good job of helping to break down those long chain fats, those uh, phospholipids and those triglycerides, starts to break them down into fatty acids and into diglycerides. But again, only a very minor fraction of of these lipids are actually going to be enzymatically digested in the mouth. Proteins, not much happens there. Um, the breaking up of the food um, allows them to be sort of uh, to be swallowed, and much of the processing with amino acids or proteins is going to happen uh, later on in the digestive process. So from the mouth, the food is going to pass to the stomach via the esophagus. And inside the stomach, the food is going to be churned mechanically and digested chemically um, and achieve a more uniform appearance. And this uniform mixture of food that gets produced by the stomach is known as chyme. Now, the pH of the stomach is very low. It's around somewhere between two and, and four. And the reason why is because your body secretes a, a strong acid known as hydrochloric acid into the stomach. Now, this acidic pH is very helpful for a number of reasons. First, it, it does help to uh, chemically break down food into smaller pieces. Also, it inactivates uh, and destroys many viruses and bacteria um, that, that reach the stomach, so it has a sort of an immunoprotective effect as well. 
But one of the negative consequences of the slow pH is those um, enzymes that were helping to enzymatically digest food in the mouth, so things like lingual lipase um, and amylase, those are going to be completely inactivated. So in terms of the processing of carbohydrates in the stomach, not much is actually going to happen here. Um, it's going to be turned, into, turned up into chyme, but a lot of the digestion of carbohydrates is actually going to occur once we get into the small intestine. In terms of fats, this is where a lot of digestion is actually going to take place. So there is another form of lipase that will be secreted. This is known as gastric lipase. And gastric lipase will take over where lingual lipase left off and start to help break down those triglycerides into diglycerides and uh, even into fatty acids. Um, more surfactant is going to be added. Again, this is going to help to break the, the lipids into smaller and smaller droplets. This is going to allow them to dissolve better into the aqueous solution that is our digestive juices um, and allow them to be digested and absorbed better than they normally would be. Proteins are going to begin to be getting digested here as well. Um, the hydrochloric acid helps to break and denature proteins, so it, it ruins their three-dimensional structure. Uh, this makes them easier to attack by, uh, by certain enzymes, so this is where the enzyme pepsin actually comes into play. So pepsin is an enzyme that is actually active at the low pH of the stomach, um, and it helps to begin breaking those bonds between the amino acids that make up the proteins. It'll take it, instead of having one long chain of amino acids, it'll be broken down into smaller chunks of, of uh, small chains of amino acids, which is the first step in, in breaking, amino, uh, breaking, breaking proteins down into individual amino acids, which is how they're going to be absorbed when they get into the intestine. So from the stomach, the food is going to pass after a period of about two to four hours into the small intestine. And once in the small intestine, uh, the chyme is going to begin, is going to be subjected uh, to some new enzymatic processes that will help to digest the food further. So once it gets to the small intestine, for example, pancreatic juices are going to begin to be secreted into the small intestine at that time. In those pancreatic juices is the enzyme pancreatic amylase. So pancreatic amylase picks up where, uh, where the uh, amylase found in the saliva left off. And this is really going to begin to uh, enzymatically break down those polysaccharides and start breaking them down into monosaccharides. Uh, where they can be processed. Um, furthermore, the, the, the villi of the intestine is going to start secreting uh, a couple other enzymes called, uh, known as disaccharidases. So these are things like maltase um, and lactase so, and sucrase. Uh, these help to break down uh, disaccharides. So the, so the amylase is going to break, the, break the, the long carbohydrates, the starches, down into disaccharides and monosaccharides. Those disaccharides will begin, begin being processed by disaccharidases, uh, things like maltase and, and um, lactase, into monosaccharides. These monosaccharides are going to be absorbed by the intestinal cells. Um, this is actually where one of the sort of unique consequences of human evolution actually comes into play. So uh, most adults are actually uh, lactose intolerant. And the reason for that is quite simply, their intestines just don't release enough of the enzyme lactase, uh, which is used to break down the lactose in the small intestine. The end result actually is that the lactose survives the small intestine rather than being absorbed like it should. It then makes it into the large intestine. In the large intestine, the bacteria that live there are happy to break down that lactose for you and use it as a fuel source. The downside is uh, that the, the, the byproducts released by that, these bacteria, these can lead to things like cramping, diarrhea, gas, bloating uh, as a result of their, their uh, lactose metabolism. So this is why people who are lactose intolerant often feel nauseated. They can have cramps. They can, have, they can be gassy. They can get diarrhea. It's because their body doesn't practice, pro process the lactose on its own, and instead the bacteria in their large intestine are processing it. Uh, and what those release as a waste product actually cause our body to feel the way that it does when we experience lactose intolerance. So the small intestine is where the majority of the monosaccharides are actually going to be absorbed, or I should say all of our carbohydrates are going to be absorbed mainly in the form of monosaccharides. Uh, so they'll actually be absorbed into the intestinal cells. If you recall from one of my previous videos, this requires the use of the, the co-transport with sodium to get there. So remember, sodium um, goes down its energy gradient, um, so its, favor its absorption is favorable that electrolyte sodium, and that is used to power the movement of monosaccharides like glucose into the intestinal cells against their concentration gradient, okay? Uh, so then they will actually pass through those intestinal cells and actually make it into the bloodstream. And from the, from the bloodstream, uh, their actual first destination is going to be the liver. 
Now, in the liver, glucose is ready to go. Glucose can actually be um, either stored by the liver in the form of glycogen, or it can be released into the bloodstream so that it can be taken up uh, by, by the body's cells and used as an energy source. And it all depends on what the current body's energy balance is at that point, right? That's a whole other video that we talked about. Um, if you're galactose, galactose is going to be uh, rapidly converted into glucose, um, and then basically whatever the fate of glucose in that body is at that point, uh, is what is going to meet the fate of that galactose. Fructose, on the other hand, is actually going to be um, rapidly deployed as a form of energy. So fructose is going to get broken down through the process of glycolysis into smaller units and eventually used to create ATP. The big thing to realize is this. All three of these monosaccharides, in one way or another, can actually be stored as a form of energy. Uh, the first stop in that process to refill your, your sort of quick release energy stores is to store it as glycogen. And glycogen is stored in the liver or in the muscle cells where it can be used as a rapid energy source. However, if our glycogen fills are completely stored, our glycogen stores are completely filled, my apologies, um, what's going to happen is a lot of that is actually going to get turned into fat. And your your uh, liver has the ability to do a process called lipogenesis. And essentially what it does is it breaks the carbohydrates down to a certain point and then reconnects the carbons and turns them essentially into fat. So over time, if you consume too many carbohydrates and not enough of them are used, they will end up getting stored in the form of adipose tissue in the form of fat to be used as um, for future energy needs as your body deems fit. So how does your body regulate when to use carbohydrate energy and when to store it? Well, a lot of it comes down to energy balance, and this has to do with a lot to do with your endocrine system. So your body seeks to keep a pretty consistent blood glucose level uh, throughout, throughout the day. So what your body does is it has specialized cells in the pancreas that are sensing glucose levels. Um, some of these cells are actually insulin secreting cells. So these pancreatic beta cells that secrete insulin inside of the pancreas, when their sensors detect that blood, glu blood glucose levels are high, they're gonna secrete the hormone insulin. And insulin flows to the bloodstream and the cells that contact it use that as a signal to basically say, hey, there's energy available, there's, there's glucose in the bloodstream, we should begin taking this up and utilizing it to perform cellular metabolism. Over time then, the cells will begin to uh, absorb that blood, the blood glucose um, and it's going, to, um, it's going to have the net effect of essentially uh, lowering the blood glucose over time. Um, so you can think of this regulatory process a bit of like a negative feedback, uh, negative feedback loop. This is not unlike a thermostat when it detects, you know, the temperature is at a certain range and it's going to turn your furnace on and that's going to heat your house. And as soon as it hits the proper uh, temperature, the furnace shuts off. And then when the thermostat again detects that the temperature has gone too far down, it then acts to turn the furnace back on. So this process just kind of repeats itself. So when blood glucose levels are high, insulin gets secreted by the pancreas. The insulin acts as a signal for your cells to begin taking in glucose, using it to produce energy. That has the net effect of lowering the blood glucose level to a certain point, and then the thermostat shuts off. No more insulin gets produced. In fact, when blood glucose levels get too low, your body secretes another hormone. The pancreas has another group of cells that are also actively monitoring um, your blood glucose levels, and these ones secrete another thing called glucagon. So glucagon has the opposite effect of glycogen. It's the signal that your blood glucose is too low. And glucagon is not only going to shut down your cells from, from absorbing glucose from the bloodstream, it's also going to activate the liver. And the liver is going to activate by breaking down its glycogen stores into individual glucose molecules and secreting those into the bloodstream. This has the net effect of raising blood glucose. This is what happens when you don't have enough glucose in your bloodstream. So together, insulin and glucagon are sort of the opposing axes of make sure, making sure that your blood glucose level stays relatively constant throughout the day. Uh, of course, individuals who have diabetes have difficult with, difficulty with this process, and we'll discuss diabetes at length in another one of my videos. So that's carbohydrates. What about lipids? namely fats and phospholipids. Well, um, now that they've made it into the small intestine, their, actu their digestion is going to be aided by the, the secretion of bile. So bile is a substance that's produced by the liver and actually stored in the gallbladder, and the, skull the gallbladder actually secretes that uh, into the intestine when food needs to be digested. So bile is a combination of bile salts, um, lecithin, and then a cholesterol derivative, which acts as a surfactant. And the goal of bile is to help make it so that these lipids could be more readily absorbed 
uh, in into the 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 digestive juices then absorbed into the cells. So um, while you have these things acting as a surfactant, which is sort of breaking down the lipids into smaller and smaller pieces and allowing them to be packaged, you also have um, you you also have uh, another uh, form of lipase that's being secreted. Uh, into uh, pancreatic lipases being secreted into the intestine that is helping to enzymatically break down these triglycerides that remain uh, into diglycerides and to fatty acids. So despite the fact that there is gastric lipase that's being secreted in the stomach, we're still only at about 30% of the enzymatic digestion needed to fully process the fatty acids. The other 70% is actually going to occur inside of the small intestine. The end result of the surfactants and the bile and, and the and the lipase uh, is going to be to break the fats down into diglycerides and, and um, fatty acids to break to make it so that the phospholipids are more easily digested and, and they're going to be packaged into uh, they're going to be absorbed um, they're, they're going to be packaged into these uh, these little things uh, called me cells and these me cells are going to be absorbed by the microvilli of the intestines and be brought into the intestinal cells. Now, inside the intestinal cells, what's going to happen is these cells are going to be broken down, and then the fat is actually going to be like repackaged back to looking like the way it's supposed to. So the triglycerides are going to be reassembled, the phospholipids will be reassembled, um, and they'll actually be then transported out, uh, into, uh, out of the intestinal cells and eventually into the bloodstream. Now, remember, these lipids are hydrophobic. So cholesterol, phospholipids, for the most part, triglycerides are all very hydrophobic, which means they're not going to be trafficked very well in your bloodstream, which is aqueous in nature because they don't mix well. So what's going to happen is these are actually all going to be packaged into these things called chylomicrons by your intestinal cells. Uh, these chylomicrons are essentially um, fatty acids and cholesterol at the core surrounded by a shell of phospholipids and some proteins. Um, and these get secreted by the intestinal cells and these go into the bloodstream um, where they can be utilized by your cells to, to form energy. Now, um, what ends up happening is these sort of evolve over time uh, and you start with these large chylomicrons, but there are also um, different types of these that are, that are circulating in your bloodstream um, and they're typically referred to according to their density. So the thing to realize is this, the um, more dense, the, the more dense the, 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 these substances are, um, the, the, the smaller they actually have to be and the less cholesterol they typically contain um, per unit weight, essentially. So um, chylomicrons are sort of the least dense of the bunch, but the ones we tend to focus on in terms of health and nutrition are uh, LDLs and HDLs. And you may high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. Um, and the reason why we focus on these are these are what are commonly referred to as, um, as good cholesterol, HDLs and bad cholesterol, LDLs. And a lot of this has to do with what the nature of these substances is, but also what they do in your body. So LDLs contain a significant amount, significantly more cholesterol uh, than HDLs do. And LDLs, by nature of what they do, they actually are absorbed by your body cells. And once they're absorbed by your body cells, uh, the fatty acids and the phospholipids are broken down and utilized for energy or to help make membranes and things like that. The cholesterol also gets released or it gets processed and some of it gets released. The end result is LDLs basically take, have the net effect of taking cholesterol to your tissues and some of that cholesterol uh, doesn't stay in your tissues very well and as a result it kind of comes out of solution and begins to accumulate on the blood vessels that traffic them. Um, this can result, this contributes to the formation of cholesterol plaques that lead to atherosclerosis and can cause things like heart uh, heart attacks and strokes. HDLs, on the other hand, contain significantly less cholesterol, and HDLs tend to circulate cholesterol back to the liver. And in the liver, the cholesterol is either removed from the body or it's sort of repackaged and utilized, um, you know, recycled and used for, for appropriate purposes. As a result, HDLs are typically referred to as good cholesterol because they don't contribute to atherosclerosis. In fact, they tend to help to lower uh, net blood cholesterol because uh, there's less of it in those HDLs. So when you go to your doctor and you get your blood drawn, they'll often look at your LDL levels and your HDL levels. And what they're really trying to figure out is what is the ratio of that? You would like to have high levels of HDLs, meaning most of the cholesterol in your body is getting recycled, processed, or eliminated versus high levels of LDLs, which would mean that this cholesterol is going to your tissue and that you are at, you are at a higher risk of developing um, heart disease later on in life.
So what about proteins? Of course, just like the other uh, two that we just spoke about, proteins are also going to be absorbed largely in the small intestine. So in addition to amylase, the pancreatic juice contains uh, two other uh, proteases known as trypsin and chymotrypsin. So just like pepsin did the stomach, trypsin and chymotrypsin also help to further break down the amino acid chains that make up these proteins. And the end result is to essentially break all of these proteins down into their individual amino acids. Amino acids can then be absorbed by the cells of the lower intestine, and at which point they're actually going to go to the liver. So unlike lipids, so fats and cholesterol and phospholipids uh, and carbohydrates, um, proteins are not typically used as a, a way to produce energy. And the reason why is proteins have a better use in your body. Proteins can be broken back down into amino acids, and those amino acids can be utilized by your body to produce the proteins you need to survive. Uh, so about 90% of all of the amino acids in your body that you digest are actually going to go to the liver and then be um, used um, and distributed by your liver and recycled. Essentially, they're going to be used by the other cells of your body to produce the proteins you need to survive, the enzymes you need to, to do metabolism, uh, the transporters you need to move things across plasma membranes, the receptors your body needs to sense the outside environment, uh, and you know, proteinaceous hormones that are needed to tell your body what to do. Now, the other 10% that are actually going to be broken down, uh, these are going to be broken down essentially by ripping off the carboxylic acid group and the amino, the nitrogen-containing amino group from these amino acids. Um, these will break down into what's referred to as nitrogenous waste, and this is uh, usually the first step actually produces a harmful toxic substance called ammonia, but it's rapidly converted by our bodies into something called urea. And, of course, urea is a key component of of urine so that's how it's going to get secreted uh it's actually going to get you're actually going to urinate out uh, any proteins that you don't need um, one of the problems that can actually happen uh, that's associated with protein metabolism is something called gout so gout happens when uh, your body produces too much nitrogenous waste and quite often people who are on uh, who do have gout uh, have to cut back on the amount of protein they consume because it's the nitrogen waste that's from, that's caused by consuming too much protein that actually leads to gout so once food leaves the small intestine, it's going to head into the large intestine. And the large intestine, um, the, the main job of the large intestine really is to remove um, excess water and also help to recapture some of the electrolytes that may still be contained within the almost fully processed food. The overwhelming majority of our nutrition from carbohydrates, proteins, and fatty acids has been absorbed in, in, in the small intestine. It's been distributed to the liver and then via the bloodstream to the parts of our body where it's going to be utilized for whatever its end purpose happens to be. Some things do make it into large intestine. So for example, um, some uh, of our dietary fiber actually is processed and aided by processing by bacteria in the intestine. Um, what's interesting is the byproducts of that bacterial digestion of that fiber um, are largely um, our, our, our fatty acids, which can actually be absorbed and gas. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that is sort of the byproduct of that bacterial metabolism, but those fatty acids can actually be absorbed by our body and utilized for food. Uh, what's interesting is um, fiber takes a lot longer to digest. So uh, if you're eating, you know, simple sugars, monosaccharides, disaccharides, that's pretty readily digested and absorbed in the intestine. Fiber takes longer. It has to be digested by the stomach and then the small intestine and then the large intestine. And the end result actually is that the glucose that's that, that your body ex extrudes from, the, from, from that fiber um, is absorbed significantly more slowly than it does with simple sugars. The result is actually a very gradual increase in blood glucose over time and a very gradual decrease in blood glucose, blood glucose over time, as opposed to simpler sugars that usually result in a sugar in a, in a glucose spike followed by a glucose crash once it's all digested by the body. It's for this reason that we think that fiber is particularly helpful in maintaining a healthy weight. It makes you feel fuller longer because your body has that sensation of, oh, I'm still adding glucose. I must be continuing to get nutrition as opposed to a big spike and then a big crash, which might make you feel hungry later. It's also why fiber might help to protect us against type 2 diabetes. You're, you're sort of easing on the gas, easing on the brakes when it comes to that insulin glucagon system, which if you're consuming, um, if you're consuming simple sugars is really sort of, holy cow, the blood, you know, blood glucose is high. We need a lot of insulin. Oh no, blood, blood glucose is now low. Now we need glucagon. Um, that, that sort of glucose curve is significantly smoother in response to dietary fiber than it is to simple sugars. 
Once we get through the, the large intestine, essentially what's left of our food is waste. It is poop. Um, and at that point, our body is taking all the nutrients that it possibly can. Um, and your body is now in the process of deciding what to do with the food that it has extracted. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you have a much better understanding now of how our body processes the food we eat and where it extracts those nutrients and where those nutrients go once they have been absorbed by our body. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope to see you again in another one of my videos. Thanks for coming. Bye.